Oh. Am I late to the party? Yanko. What's up, everybody? Hi, hi. Hi, Yanko. All, all good, my friend. Uh, Sorry uh, for being late. How are you? Oh, oh, good, good. No problem, Yanko. I know you're a busy man, and no problem, no problem. Hvala, hvala ti, ovaj, da to napraviš s nama, ovaj, i um, da, da, da uzimaš vreme, da, da si s nama danas. Nema na čemu, thank you for having me, guys. You're doing an amazing job, so keep it up. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, Janko, so um, let's start. Let's start. When I did the interviews, you know, with Paul Ennegon, Mark Filipusis, you know, we had, we had some good guys on here and a lot of friends of mine, you know, from Serbia, like Lau, Lau which was on here. And, uh, okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, so we, we had a good time. So we always start, Janko. Um, how, how did you get into tennis? Just shortly, and then we're going to go with the... With the, <laughs> the heavy, heavyweight stuff. With heavyweight stuff. Okay. Uh, I guess like every other kid, there was um, uh, in the primary school that I ended up going to, which I could see from my bedroom window in the... And you call this in the uh, PE gym, physical education gym. There was a school of tennis two weeks, uh, two times per week. I was a very energetic kid. So instead of breaking shit around the house, uh, my parents decided to enter me into the school of tennis. So this is how I started. Okay. And, very uh... simple. Yeah, very, very simple. And then, you, have you always been on top of, of your age groups in, in Serbia, Janko? Like I was. Went... I was always starting from the age of 10. I was always the best in my generation and one of the best in the generation above. So mainly I was playing with uh, older kids. But um, uh, I always had good and decent junior results <laughs> when yeah. I was younger. So, Janko, I don't know if you remember because I had to let it. So, um, Vladimir Stojakovic. Of course. So, yeah. Of so, course. you were in Berlin, and you know, I tell those people when I met you first, and we were like, we were hitting like once or twice in Berlin. I don't know if you remember. It was 2003, and oh I think you, you prepared for Challenger in Wolfsburg. And okay. uh, Vladimir was one of my coaches and one of my mentors. He's uh, one of my very good friends, and since I moved to the US, we have still contact, but not as much as we had before. So um, we were hitting, and that's, I remember, I just want to let it out, so much fun. Uh, you know, you, you were, you're a young guy. I think you were like 18 at that time, I believe. Like, and, um, or like, and you were 183 in ATP. And, uh, oh, my God. <laughs> and you were there. That. So that was a long time when I met you first. And then you, and what, we played like a couple of sets. The first set. You know, you, you beat me like six three or something. Was on a fast surface in, in in Berlin, you know. And then after that, you you just got used to everything and just killed it. And I I will never forget that because uh, you were like laser in the training session because probably you know you were there with your dad and and uh, and then uh, Vladi was there and you were so focused. And I was like, shit, that kid is like unbelievable. And then you played Challenger on Wolfsburg, and I think you went to the semis there after it. That's how I met you. I probably don't remember. It's a long time. No, but, uh... I, remember, uh, I remember the Wolfsburg Challenger. I don't remember playing you. I'm being as honest as I possibly yeah. can be. No problem, but no uh, one, of the, one of the reasons for my discipline was actually uh, Vlade. He was a very strict coach when I was uh, young. Then, sadly, he decided to move to Berlin, so I had to switch yep. coaches. But I was even lucky then to find uh, uh, the coach which helped me until my senior career, Roman Savochkin from Russia. And he yep. was also really, like, hardcore, you know, disciplined. I wasn't... Uh, I don't think I was born disciplined. Even on the contrary, I started, you know, doing tattoos and piercings and dyeing my hair when I was 16 years yep. old. So, yeah. but one of the two biggest mentors in my earlier stages were Vladimir and uh, and, yeah. and Roman, and they made me uh, very disciplined. Yeah, I love that. I, I, he taught me, and then I just remember always element, element, and then you had to. <laughs> I love, I love it. So, um, yeah, long story. Okay, so, um, Janko, 
um, you know, let's go a little bit through, um, you know, at the moment with, with, you know, the guys from Serbia, we have so many good players, you know, as I said, Lauvić, Krajnovic, Kecmanovic, Laszlo, Jerry, um, there's so many out there. And I wanted to ask you, since you have this beautiful academy back and Novak has his academy, and I know you guys all train always together, how, how much does that play in that you have such a close relation to many of the players and you guys train in, in Belgrade together? Uh, I think the, the, the basic, let's call it, tennis community was established uh, many years ago when I was very young and Novak was very young and Victor was very young and Nenad. And then we kind of grew up together through playing Davis Cup. I was lucky enough to play Davis Cup for a period of 17 years of my career. Uh, and then the younger guys like uh, uh, Laszlo Jere, Filip Krajinovic, Dusan Lajovic, even Miomir Kismanovic, they kind of, you know, took over the, the friendly friendship culture that even though it's this friendly rivalry between players, it's always, you know, uh, you know positive impact when we are all together. My favorite weeks of my individual professional career were, were the Davis Cup weeks when I was uh, with the guys because for all of us, these, uh, these players are not just professional colleagues, but they are my personal best friends in my life. So I think this plays a big role in creating a, a good community because if you know, you obviously, when you have Novak in your team, it's much easier to play good in terms of a team sport, but you have a lot of good nations that uh, have good players, but didn't have so much success, you know, as a team, just because the guys or the girls even were not uh, getting along. So let's talk to about the Davis Cup, Janko, when you guys won it, uh, against friends, right? I think it was. You were 1-2 one, two down and then you guys won it 3-2, right? Yeah, this was, uh, I don't even remember the year, but it was the most happiest I ever felt on the tennis court, even though I played like shit and lost to Monfi. <laughs> uh, Novak won uh, two and then Victor won the deciding point. But uh, tennis in Serbia at least was at its peak in that moment with... You know, Novak being number one and Anna being number one and Jelena being number one and Zimonic being number one and we, you know, winning Davis Cup and, and everything. So it was definitely the most favorite moment of my career. So is, is Davis Cup for you as well, like most, most special? Like when you play the Grand Slams, you know, you play for yourself, but like you play for your country. And I'm from Croatia and I know how we are at the Balkan, right, with the pride and, you know, we, we love... <laughs> For me, but for me, it was never about pride. I never took myself as a bigger patriot than any other Serbian or Croatian that you can find in the street here. For me, the emotion was not being driven by I am proud to be Serbian and I want to show everybody how Serbians are strong. I didn't really care about that. The main emotion that I was... Uh, uh, having what why I was playing best in Davis Cup is because I loved being with my best friends. This sure. was the reason why all of us played well. And if I didn't, you know, I don't even know the, the amount of matches that I played, but if I didn't get along with the people in the team, I probably wouldn't have played as long as I did for the national team. Got you. Okay. That's good. And then um, during your playing career, Janko, I mean, you know, you beat... That, that all the guys you beat Novak, you beat Burdic, uh, Fernando Gonzalez. So you had so many Andy Murray, so many so big, so many big wins uh, you had, and you reached the high of eight and 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 ATP. What did that all, Janko? What did the tennis career you had and all the struggles you had to go through and injuries and everything? What did I uh, see you now? You know, as a happy family man, right? And that that that's most important for us. Is, is I have a little, little son who's five. What did that teach you? and you could translate into, into your life after, after tennis? Without sounding too uh, cocky and emotional, uh, yeah. I honestly believe that tennis is, uh, in a way, a game of life. And um, 
I tell to all of the players in uh, our academy or whoever I'm helping or coaching, whatever, that you essentially are completely alone on the court, which is essentially how we go throughout our lives. You know, all, most of us have wives, children, whatever, but we are, you know, without sounding too emotional, we are born alone and we're going to die alone. So... Yeah. The point of understanding the responsibility that you're completely alone on the tennis court is essentially building your character. If you are able to build your character through different aspects of living your tennis life, because tennis is not a sport, it's a way of life. I draw tremendous uh, value from that in later on going to my uh, private life in educating my kids, educating my youngest the son and daughter and how I am as a person, all the way up to helping me understand the business side of tennis more and helping me move forward to the next chapter of my life. Love that. I love that. And you, you were talking about, you know, character traits and everything. You know, in your academy, we live in a, in, in a time, you know, where, you know, that the kids, a lot of kids are on, on the phones, on the PlayStations, a lot of kids, parents have to work, both parents have to work. So I guess, you know, they just drop their kids off and, 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 and kids, uh, I, I feel like, you know, kids have it harder in our days because there's so much stimulation and there's so many things that distract them. How in your academy, for example, Yanko, you know, how, how, do you have, like, you know, Emilio, a good friend of mine, Emilio Sanchez, you know, he has certain values in his academy. When you open your academy, how, what, what, are, what are the values? How, how do you keep everything t together in the academy? You, you know, to be honest with you, uh, I'm a big believer about, even though this is present and this exists in our lives, and I am always the person which looks forward. You either get with the times or you die by living in the past. And I hate and living in the past. Hate is maybe too strong of a word, no, but I always, like. I always dislike it, exactly. I always tend to look where we are now and what are we doing moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in not even talking about these things. These, I think too, too much in these days, and I don't want to sound like an old head who used to play, and you know how these ex-players are saying, you know, in my time it was much better, and all this kind of bull crap. But <laughs> every time is different. Yes. You either get with the times or you don't. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we don't talk about these things. We accept that we live in, I think now it's not even millennials, it's Generation Z or whatever. <laughs> But we don't talk about Facebook or Instagram or whatever in terms of trying to, trying to approach a player too much from a mental aspect kind of game. I'm a big believer if there is something wrong essentially in your game, there is only one way to fix it. Now, in all of our academies, we have a methodology. How do we conduct our work? Because I believe that there is a certain way, how do you need to teach people how to play tennis? Mm -hmm. Even aside of that, completely simplifying it, like my coach, Dear Kordorf, was doing. Okay, you have a problem with your first serve. We assess the problem, that this, the problem may be the way you toss the ball, the way you rotate your shoulders, the way you turn your hips or whatever. Mm -hmm. And after we assess the problem, we don't talk about it. You serve one million fucking first serves. And after one million first serves, after that, you don't have a problem anymore. Love Very, it. You create by assessing the problem and creating essentially a muscle memory, which is att uh, attached to your brain. You implement good habits that later on do not drain your energy about to, to think about them. What essentially do you need to do? It's very simple, like when you're trying to teach a child or a young person that every single morning you need to brush your teeth. And then when you, the, the goal is that you come to a point that even if you don't feel like brushing your teeth, you still do it. Yep. 
wake up in the morning, you had a bad night's sleep, you, you know, slept like shit, you feel terrible, but yeah. you still go to the bathroom and you still brush your teeth without thinking, should I or should I not do it? I don't believe it's an issue these days about, you know, I accept that there are way more distractions than when you and me were being brought up. But you just don't talk about these things. The real issue and problem is that people in tennis sometimes try too much to go into the mental aspect of the game and talking with psychiatrists and psychologists and sports experts or whatever, which I believe is even worse than doing what they were doing before. I like that. I like that approach, and I like, you know, like from coaching standpoint, you know, so many kids, as you said, it's all about the muscle memory repetition, and then, and the mind, the mind, though, you know, have you always had that mindset, Janko, that when you, you know, when, like, that you control, when you control your mind, like you said, with the brushing the teeth, right, or like so many people struggle in life, losing weight because they're too soft, probably. No, I don't say all, oh, but people give in too early right but if you you control what you do that's my when I teach as well and tell the kids you know you're in charge of what you do and there's no excuse you know like you said with the surf if you toss it too far in front of you get out there and toss one million times the ball straight above you and then one time it's going to work you know as you said with the reps did you always have that mindset when you were young or did you learn that but when I, you... I was lucky enough to be surrounded by good people I think a lot of our um uh, first of all, a lot of our character on the tennis court is being driven from the household that we grew up in. Yeah. Our parents taught us to be. And some of us yeah. this way and the others are in, in a different way. I believe that I was tremendously lucky enough to be surrounded by chance, by accident, with the right people. Like Vlade, for example. Yes, yes. Unbelievable I'm guy. Supposed to be maybe you know i generally don't believe in destiny because i believe we create our own destiny yeah. but Lade was not a part of my life maybe the building up of my character in younger stages would not be the same similarly to my next coach and my next coach and my next coach yeah. but you hit the nail on the head uh, essentially there's an old saying we are what we do we yeah. are uh, the, the defining moment of assessing a character or who and what somebody is, is not what they think. It's actually what they do. So people, I believe in, in tennis, and this is the, the real cancer of the story, they try to control their thoughts in order to control their actions. But actually, <coughs> the opposite way. You control your thoughts by doing something because if you continuously do something not only that you build character but when a negative emotion strikes you which as we all know there's a ton of emotions like this on the tennis courts with fear anxiety stress nervousness and everything else it doesn't strike you in the same way because whatever you feel you still go to the toilet and brush your teeth yeah so the, the, the essence of the emotion that is hitting you is not glorified by the emotion itself. Because whatever happens, you still go to the bathroom and brush your teeth. Very simple. Yeah, love it. And I love it. It's very deep. And uh, I, I like that. I like that. Um, Janko, you're, you're after the career, you know, did you always plan to open the academy and have the resort? So how did everything, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, you know, how you how you uh, starting to expand the resorts, where you, where you are and how, how you started with the academy? Uh, very uh, early, let's say in the middle of my career, I knew that I will stay in tennis and that I will be wearing a tracksuit all my life. I never saw myself diversifying into any other areas and, you know, acting like a big shot businessman in a suit or whatever, not because I have anything against these people. You have tennis players, ex-tennis players that did tremendously good work in business, but I always knew that I wanted to stay connected in, in tennis and not diversify into whatever construction and agriculture or whatever, you know, professional. Uh, nine years ago, we opened our first academy with very 
that another academy, we opened another academy, last year we took another. So long story short, in Belgrade, uh, we are currently working and functioning on four different locations. Uh, okay. Worldwide, uh, two years ago, we opened our first three facilities in Shenzhen, China, with 27 courts and 1,400 kids. Uh, last year, beginning of the year, we opened our second academy in Cancun, Mexico. And by the, be by the middle of 2021, uh, we are scheduled to open three more academies in uh, uh, Netanya, Israel, Andalusia, Spain, and Berlin, Germany. This is the idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm the right guy, Anko, there in Berlin. I know everybody there. So oh. If you need any help there, I will... obviously have you have Lani there, but you know. I told you, I, I can't disclose more information about the location, yeah. but it will be coming very soon. And, nice. hope, and hopefully knock on wood in, um, in September, another academy in Dubai. So wow. this idea and plan. Uh, this is my full-time job. I decided not to go back on tour to, you know, be a, a full-time coach. I did it in 2020 helping Philip Krajinovic and I yeah. enjoy it very much. But this is something that, this is something that uh, I really enjoy. I enjoy spending, these days I'm spending too much fucking time in the office dealing with all sorts of, you know, nonsense. But the yeah. thing that most is spending time on the tennis court, you know, with, with players and with kids, and I, I just enjoy it so much. Nice, nice. And then Andalusia, you know, Yanko, I, I lived in Spain for a while in Malaga, so Andalusia is a great area for tennis, you know, so you're gonna, the whole year warm, it's good. I, I'm super excited to hear that, and uh, nice, nice, nice. Well done, well done with the after career as well, Yanko. I, I uh, first of all, thank you. This is something that we are planning to do. I don't consider our, our, ourselves successful by any means. There's still a lot of work to be done. What we try to bring to our partners is actual real value in return. One of the biggest problems of opening any international academy is that the business model is being created. Hi, my name is Yanko. Give me money because I used to be Yanko. And then you put a billboard and then you hope that millions of kids will enter the club, which is the biggest lie in history of tennis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more work to be done in order to create the right culture, the right ecosystem, the right financial viability for the actual location. So it's a lot of hard work. And uh, I, you know, without sounding too pretentious, I believe that we are the pioneers of this in this industry. Nice. Nice. Yanko, let me see if I have... Oh, yeah, with your academy. One more question with your academy. Do you have, like, all levels? Can regular people in Belgrade come and hit there? I like... Uh, I, I really want that the, our name uh, is associated with tennis. I don't want people to think that because I used to be a player, that only high-performance athletes that can practice six hours a day can come. This is... A our core business because we target and market ourselves as a high performance tennis academy uh, and most of our clientele are players between let's say, 12 and 18 25 all the way up to ATP and WTA pros but I believe if you create the the right mix the right culture the right ecosystem there's place for everybody to coexist in the same facility nice. I, lo I love I love that you, you know, the, as you said earlier, there were many academies in the past where the name was there and they, the guys were not even, you know, involved and, and, and that doesn't work in our day. So I really love to see, you know, look, I know Emilio very well, Emilio and Arancha, and I live here close to them, like a couple of hours away in there in Naples. And uh, Emilio is always doing things like you, you know, he's involved and, uh, and I think that's important to, to be successful in what you do. If you put, if you put your heart in there and your, in your time and your passion, then uh, things go well. This is not one of the reasons he's successful. This is the main reason yeah. why his name was attributed to one of the world's most successful international academies in Barcelona or Naples or whatever. This yeah. is the main, main reason. There's no other reason. All yeah. 
importance come after that. The promotion, the marketing, the name, the fact that him and Casal were good players, but this is just... It's percentages 10-15%, but the main core, why uh, he was and still is very successful, is this exactly what you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Janko, I, may, I can't thank you enough that you, that you took your time. As I said earlier, you have, your, you have your people and everything, but if you ever need an Andalusia, I've spent the years and years, and, uh, and obviously I'm from Berlin, and I'm still very well connected with the German Federation, you know, and uh, so if you need anything, please don't hesitate uh, to contact me. As I said, I had Dushane on, um, I had Danilo on, um, Laszlo, now you, now oh. just with Krajnovic and Kecmanovic and maybe one day Novak, but I'm so thankful that you do that. I started to do um, the lives last year when pandemic hit, you know, and I was thinking, and I saw earlier Ante Pavic, my very good friend, was on here too. Um, so, you know, and I just thought, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult times we're in and it's so nice of you guys that you all played in and to give your time for the sport. And that's why you're all so successful because you have so much passion for the sport. So I wanted to thank you so much for doing that. Having me can do this again in a month or uh, later or sooner even. You're doing a tremendous work. Just keep it up. Thank you, Janko, and uh, enjoy the day with the family, and we stay in touch, Janko. Guys, thank you for everyone who was listening to, <laughs> to the channel. Bye.